Okay, welcome. We're going to be talking about aldehydes and ketones. Why don't you join me on page 128 of your workbook. What we're going to do in this video, this is our aldehydes and ketones review. And we will be looking at naming and reactions. So IUPAC naming of both aldehydes and ketones. Um, and then oxidation reaction, oxidation reduction reactions. So IUPAC naming, oxidation reduction reactions for both aldehydes and ketones. Um, if you take a look at the structures that I have at the top here, two common sugars, glucose and fructose. Glucose has an aldehyde functional group. Fructose has a ketone functional group. Make sure that you remember how to identify aldehydes and ketones. Aldehydes and ketones both have a carbon double bonded to oxygen. Carbon, of course, makes four bonds. If two of the bonds are going to oxygen, it needs two more. Depending on what those two more bonds are, that's what determines if it's aldehyde or ketone. If one or both of the bonds are to hydrogen, that's aldehyde. But if both of the two bonds on either side of the carbon double bond, if both of those bonds go to carbon, that's ketone. Fructose has a ketone plus a bunch of alcohol groups. Fructose has aldehyde plus a bunch of al alcohol groups. And in this video, we're looking at aldehydes and ketones. So let's start with the naming. I will ask you to join me on page 123. Page 123, actually that's not it, hang on. Sorry. Join me on page 131. Page 131 has a number of uh, practice problems for naming aldehydes and ketones. It's gonna be very much like the alcohols that we did in the previous video. What you wanna do first is make sure you know what you're talking about, like what is it? This is an aldehyde. Since it's an aldehyde, we know that the name will end in AL. How do we get there? We'll do the same process we did for alcohols. Highlight the longest continuous chain that includes that aldehyde functional group. Making sure you realize that it might not be the straight across chain. For example, if I had highlighted straight across, I would have had one, two, three, four carbons, but I can see that there's a chain of one, two, three, four, five carbons if I allow it to have a bend. After we do that, oh, I notice that we have a methyl group attached. We want number closest to the functional group. Number that parent chain starting closest to the functional group. So this is carbon one, two, three, four, five. And then I can, I can write the name. I will say that this is a 3-methyl pentanel. 3-methyl pentanel. Here's the methyl group sitting on carbon 3. So this is our methyl group. It's attached to carbon 3. Pent is because there's five carbons in the parent chain. Al because it's an aldehyde. But I really want you to notice, I'll even make a note, I'll say note. You uh, should not put a one here. The aldehyde group is always, it has to be at the end. Aldehyde has to be at the end of the chain because of it, what the structure of that functional group is. It only has one available bond to connect to the rest of the molecule, so it has to be at the end. There are organic compounds, to be clear, there are organic compounds that have many, many different functional groups, and so the aldehyde, which will always be at the end, it would maybe not be at carbon one, but the we're not naming terribly complicated aldehydes, so the aldehyde, which always is at the end, 
will be at the carbon one end for anything that we're naming. So you don't put a one because there's no choice of where the, al where the aldehyde could be. This structure here, I see the aldehyde. I highlight the longest continuous chain that includes the aldehyde. I number closest to the end with that aldehyde. I identify if there's anything attached, which there is, there's a methyl group. So this would be for methyl hexanal. Hex because there are six carbons in the longest chain. Al because it's aldehyde. There's not a one here because the aldehyde has to be at the end. Methyl and carbon four. How about this one? This is that line angle notation. Here's carbon one, two, three, four, five. I see a methyl group attached at carbon four and then a methyl group attached at carbon three. So this would be named three, four, dimethyl pentanal. Three, four, dimethyl pentanal. Di means that there's two different methyl groups. And since there's two different methyl groups, they each get their own number. One of them is at carbon three, the other is at carbon four. Don't be fooled by um, <clears throat> the abbreviation. Remember that CHO abbreviates aldehyde. I skipped over number four. Number four would be ethanol. There's only two carbons in the parent chain, so that's an ethanol. Here's three carbons, so this would be propanol. And this is a total of eight carbons, so this would be octanel. There's nothing attached. You can tell by the string of CH2 groups in the middle that this is, looks like this if I were to draw it out. So that's octanel. Again, the CHO always abbreviates aldehyde. So those are a few examples of naming aldehydes. Let's do a few more examples of naming ketones. Those are on the back side, page 132. On this page, it looks like I've put a bunch of ketones. So let's look at those. Here is the actual ketone functional group. Carbon double bonded to oxygen with a carbon either side, that's ketone. That's what a ketone group looks like. So highlight the longest continuous chain that includes that ketone. Number from the end closest to that functional group. Identify if there's any additional groups attached, <clears throat> which there is. There's a methyl on carbon three. So I would name this ketone this way, three methyl, two butanone. Now I'm going to make another note here. I will say, note, you do you do always need a number here to indicate which carbon has that carbon double bond O. It's never at the end. I'm going to make that for ketones. The carbon double bond O is never on the end. Because if it were, it'd be, it would be aldehyde. So I hope that that is not so much of a memorization thing for you as just noticing the aldehyde uh, carbon oxygen double bond always has to be at the very end because remember aldehydes look like this. So the carbon is always at the end. It's not possible to sneak another carbon over here. Hydrogen only makes one bond. So the carbon double bond O for aldehydes is always at the end, but for ketones, because of what a ketone is, it is a carbon double bond O in between two carbons. And because it's in between two carbons, the C double bond O is never at the end. 
So this needs a number in the name to tell us where is that carbon double bond O. This one does not have a number. So let's do the others. Here, this is a ketone. I see that there are a total of three, um, three carbons. So this is propanone. And I will say this, I say you always need a number to indicate where is the carbon double bond. This is probably the one time that you don't need a number because there's no choices. The carbon double bond O cannot be on carbon one or carbon three. Remember, if, if it's on the end, it's not a ketone anymore. This is a very small ketone. In fact, it's the smallest possible ketone. So that's the only time that you will notice there's not a number in front. And honestly, if you were to put a two in front, that would be fine. Everyone would still know what you're talking about. Let's look at the one below. Here's the ketone. Methyl is attached. Well, number closest to the oxygen or closest to the ketone. Make sure I did that right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, so this will be a four. The methyl is on carbon four and the ketone itself, the carbon double bond O is carbon three. There's a total of seven oxygen, seven carbons in the longest continuous chain. So that's why I put hept. The C double bond O is on carbon three, methyl on carbon four. Let's look at the next one. This is a cyclic compound. So we know that the name will start with cyclo. This is cyclobutanone. This, because of four carbons, this one is five carbons. So this is cyclopentanone. You will not be naming any cyclic ketones that have additional groups attached. So they'll be very simple cyclic ketones like these two. The last one down here, I want you to notice that there's some cond condensed notation right there. When you see parentheses like that, that means that, that there's branching. And so condensed notation indicates that. I highly recommend that you sketch out the structure before you figure out the naming. The best way to sketch it out, I'm looking at this carbon right here that I'll in fact highlight. That highlighted carbon up there is this carbon here. And we can see that that yellow carbon has three methyl groups attached. One, two, three. And then there's a carbon double bond O and then carbon, 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 carbon. So this is not yet naming. This is just making sure you know how to uncondense a structure to see what the bonding looks like. I've just done that, I've uncondensed it. This helps me see that the longest continuous chain that contains that ketone is seven. And I'll number it closest to the ketone group. I see that there's a methyl attached at carbon two and another methyl attached at carbon two. So this one would be named 2,2-dimethyl. 3-heptanone. If you get stuck on this one, it, I imagine that where you get stuck is, is in identifying what the bonding looks like. So again, I would recommend drawing it out, sketching it out in a different way of complete notation or line angle notation or what I've done here, skeleton notation, something to uncondense so that it's a little bit easier to see what's attached. So we have just taken a look at uh, naming for aldehydes and ketones. Let's see where that is. <clears throat> We've looked at naming for aldehydes and ketones and now I'd like to look at some reactions. In the previous, so I'm gonna have you head to page 133. But in the previous video and in class, we talked about oxidation reduction reactions of alcohols. That actually helps launch our understanding of what aldehydes and ketones do. I would like you to very briefly flip your paper back to page 122. So all the way back to when we were looking at alcohols. Why don't you go ahead and pause the video so that you can get yourself to page 122. Now that you've done that, 
take a look. When we were learning about what alcohols do, we said oxidation is making more bonds to oxygen, which means if you're gaining bonds to oxygen, you're losing bonds to something else, and that something else is H. So we gave examples. A primary alcohol, can it get oxidized? Remember how we did it. We said, I don't know. Let's draw it out to find out. So we drew it out with no hydrogen showing and so on. I'll do this in the, in the examples with aldehyde and ketone, but I wanted to, to have a start here so that you realize you've already learned a little bit about what aldehydes and ketones do. You already learned that aldehyde can get oxidized to form a carboxylic acid. A ketone cannot get oxidized. The carbon already is using up all four of its bonds. So let's look at a few examples of specifically aldehydes and ketones getting, trying to do reactions. We'll be coming back to this page though, page 122. I'll be coming back to this in a, in a little bit. So keep it handy. Now we'll go to our practice problems on page 133 of aldehydes and ketones. It's asking us to, to predict the products. Um, how do you know? How do you know if it's oxidation or reduction? I'm going to make a little note up here, common lab oxidizing agents. What did you see in lab? You saw this was the bright orange solution from lab, sodium dichromate. It's the, it's the chromium in that dichromate ion that's doing the oxidizing. It's not the sodium, it's the chromate. And so whether it's sodium as a cation or potassium as a cation, either of those will function as a good oxidizing agent. Um, you didn't actually work directly with the sodium dichromate. You just looked at examples of it. Um, you did work directly with Tollens and Benedict's. Benedict's is the bright blue solution um, that changes to a green or a red or a yellow, depending. Um, Tullens was the oxidizing agent that makes a silver solution. So these are all common lab oxidizing agents, which means if you see something reacting with any of these, it's an oxidation reaction. We did not work with, uh, we did not do reduction in the lab. Um, so you don't have that experience to draw on, but I will tell you that Hydrogen, H2 itself, is a good reducing agent. It needs a catalyst. The catalyst is almost always some sort of metal. It might be nickel or H2 with platinum. Um, H2 palladium. The key is the hydrogen because remember, reduction is gaining bonds to hydrogen. So of course you need some hydrogen. So if you see any of these, that means it's reduction. If you see these, it means it's an oxidation reaction. So that's how you want to start. When you get to complete the reaction, you want to say, what even have, am I dealing with? You know, what, am, what have I got? This is aldehyde. And then what kind of reaction is it? Oh, I see that I'm going to try to do reduction of the aldehyde. How do you do that? It's not a memorization thing. Instead, start by drawing the structure with no H's shown. So copy it exactly as it was with no H's shown. That will look like this. Include the O, of course. Reduction means gain bonds to O or lose a bond to, gain bond to H, lose bond to O. So we need to lose bond to O. If this is what we started with, once it gets reduced, and I'm copying it just like it was, but instead of two bonds to O, I will draw it with one bond to O. That's what reduction is, removing a bond um, to oxygen or from oxygen. So there used to be two bonds to O here. That was our aldehyde. Now there's only one. It's a little bit harder to see what kind of functional group it is until you draw the H's back in. Hydrogen needs to have two bonds always. Here, it's two bonds were to the carbon, but over here, there's only one bond to carbon, which means the other is to an H. As soon as I put the H's back in, then it's easier for me to see, oh yeah, that's an alcohol. You can see that it's a primary alcohol. I will make a little note here, note. 
um, reduction ends with alcohol. What by that I mean is we don't remove that final bond to oxygen. In other words, this will not get further reduced by getting rid of that. It ends with alcohol. We don't remove that final bond to O. So this is our final answer. This is what we started with, and I recopied that here. This is what we started with, and this is the product. How about this example? Again, start by saying, what am I even doing? What, is, what kind of reaction is it? This is an oxidation, oxidizing agent, which means this is oxidation. I can see that I have aldehyde. So I will copy it as it was with no H's showing. I copied it with no H's showing. Then I look at the carbon that already has bonds to oxygen and ask for this carbon, is there room for any more bonds to O? And the answer is yes. Only three bonds are shown, which means there's room for one more. There used to be two bonds, now there's room for three. As you know, you cannot do a triple bond to oxygen. So if there are three bonds to oxygen, it will look like this, a double bond and then a single bond. And that's it, that can't go anymore because that carbon now is using up all four of its bonds. Um, so this is our final answer. And at that point, we can put H's back in so that it's easier to identify the functional group. Oxygen has both its bonds shown. It does not get an H. Carbon has all four of its bonds shown. It does not get an H. But this oxygen is only showing one of its bonds. It needs two, so it gets an H. That helps me see what this functional group is. This is a carboxylic acid. So a aldehyde gets oxidized to produce carboxylic acid. How about the next one? This is reduction. Reduction means take away a bond to oxygen. Nothing else changes. So if there used to be a ring, you need to keep it a ring. You can't just randomly like open up the ring. It stays like that. Here's the carbon. There used to be two bonds to oxygen. If we take away one bond, now there'll be only one left. So there used to be two bonds. Ox reduction is get rid of bonds to O all the way down until you have only one. So once you're down to only one bond to O, that's your answer. At that point, draw the H's in to be able to more easily see the functional group. Oxygen needs to have two bonds showing, so it needs an H. This carbon is showing two bonds, so it needs two more. And so this is a primary alcohol. We started with an aldehyde and we end up with a primary alcohol. Tollens is oxidation. That's an oxidizing agent. It's a weak oxidizing agent and it can react with aldehydes. And how we will do that is again, copy it exactly as it was. There used to be two bonds to O. We draw it with no H's showing, everything the same, but no H's showing. The carbon that has bonds to oxygen, ask yourself, is there room for any more bonds to oxygen? The answer is yes. After this though, we cannot do any more. Carbon is using up all four of its bonds. So it cannot get oxidized any further. That's how you know that you're done. And at that point, go back in and, and polish up the functional group by adding in H. Oxygen already has two bonds showing, it does not get an H. Carbon already has four bonds showing, it does not get an H. But this oxygen is only showing one bond, it needs one more, so it gets an H. And then we can more easily see, there it is, that's a carboxylic acid. When you oxidize an aldehyde, you get a carboxylic acid. When you reduce an aldehyde, you go backwards and get the primary alcohol. Oxidation and reduction are opposite of each other. Um, the next one, tolerance is an oxidizing agent. This is a weak oxidizing agent. Tolerance 
and Benedict's. In fact, I'm going to put this up at the top. These two are weak. These two are strong. And I will summarize what that means. Strong oxidation can oxidize alcohol or aldehyde. Weak oxidation can only oxidize the aldehyde. And this is a weak oxi oxidizing agent, tollens. So notice, I see that there's an aldehyde here and I see that there's an alcohol, but tollens cannot oxidize alcohol. Weak oxidation means only aldehyde can get oxidized. Think of it this way, aldehyde is kind of halfway done. It already has two bonds to oxygen. So it's a little bit easier to get the job done. So an oxidizing agent that's weak can do oxidation on something that doesn't have as much work left to do. So how do we know what the product will look like? Remember, if it was a ring before, it's still a ring. This alcohol will still be an alcohol because it cannot get oxidized. The carbon used to have two bonds to oxygen but oxidation means make more bonds to oxygen if you can. This carbon has three bonds showing, which means there's room for one more. So oxidation is making more bonds to O. This carbon now has four bonds showing, all four, so it, it's done. It cannot do, not, cannot do any more oxidation. To be able to more easily identify the functional group, we add the hydrogens back in. This oxygen already has two bonds, it does not get an H. This carbon already shows its four bonds. It does not get an H, but this bond, this oxygen is not, it's only showing one bond, so we need to add back in the H. That helps us identify this as a carboxylic acid. Last but not least is the bottom one. I see that we are going to be doing reduction, which means losing bonds to oxygen. How do you know what you'll do? Copy the structure the same except for the carbon with oxygen. So if we had this benzene ring before, we still have the benzene ring. If we had CH2, CH3, we still do. We used to have a carbon with two bonds to O. In fact, I'll just, I'll just redraw the whole structure. This is what we had to start with. And then if we are reducing it, The only thing that changes is how many bonds to O on that carbon of the aldehyde. There used to be two bonds to O, now there'll be just one bond to O. And that's it, remember we, we don't remove that final bond to O. So this is our product. Looks a little bit odd, but that's because we need to draw the hydrogens back in. Oxygen gets one, carbon gets two. And we can see that this is a primary alcohol. So the aldehyde got reduced to form a primary alcohol. I mentioned that I wanted to, to end this video by going back to page 122. So let's do that right now. I'll give you a moment, pause the video if you need to do that, to come back to page 122 where we did a, the introduction and overview of this oxidation reduction um, system. What I had done when I introduced it with alcohols is the oxidation. Now what I'll do, since we've just been doing some practice with it, I'll summarize on this page what does reduction look like. Reduction is just the reverse. So we can do this. Reduction is just the opposite of oxidation, the reverse of oxidation. This helps me see that if I have a carboxylic acid, I can reduce it to form an aldehyde. And that continues to be reduced to form a primary alcohol. If I start with an aldehyde, I could either oxidize it to produce carboxylic acid, or I could reduce that aldehyde to produce a primary alcohol. If I have a ketone, I cannot oxidize it, but I could reduce it 
um, to form the secondary alcohol. So oxidation and reduction um, are the reverse, and I can add to the reduction. Oxidation is more bonds to O, reduction is losing bonds to oxidation, losing bonds to oxygen. So that, those are the reactions of aldehyde and ketone. Oxidation for aldehyde, reduction for aldehyde, and reduction for ketone. Thank you for joining for this video.